So goal setting, you know, maybe giving yourself process targets that you can work towards that can help develop that sense of confidence. So it could be making sure that you get bat face to the ball, getting your head over the ball, keeping your balance. Those, those could be small little things that you focus on. Self-talk could be positive affirmations that you give to yourself before you face up. Um, the other one, um, relaxation techniques. So being able to perhaps control your breathing, feel grounded. And then imagery, at the most basic level, we can picture something in our head. But then actually where that becomes really powerful is by incorporating different senses. And prior to facing a ball, allowing yourself to almost feel like you're there. So Cricket Life Stories with me, Neil Kagram. Today we're joined by Marcus Nell, sports cricket psychologist. Marcus, how's it going? Yeah, not bad. Thank you, Neil. Um, delighted to be on, on your show today. No, grateful to have you on. So Marcus, we're going to talk about the subject of psychology, specifically to do with cricket. Before we get into it, let's talk a little bit about your background. How many years have you been involved in the field and what specifically have you been doing in the cricket world? Okay, so um, in, in terms of being involved in the field, um, I, I kind of started specialising it specialising in sports psychology in about 2015, 16. Um, so that basically looked like doing my master's, um, which which takes a year. And then immediately after that began my supervised practice. And <clears throat> that's basically having the opportunity to build up clientele, um, build up your experiences in the field, and then hopefully qualify at the end of that period. Um, I am now qualified, I've got my own business that runs alongside um, my, the sports psychology. And it's, it's something that I've, I've become deeply passionate about. Um, and it actually started way back when I was making my GCSE decisions. Um, so it kind of started really broad. And then over the last couple of years has, has narrowed down a bit. And in the last two years so I'm going into my third season um, I've been spending quite a bit of time working in uh, cricket and that's been with Gloucester Cricket Club um, working with the academy players there and so that's kind of becoming a niche in some sense is working with youth athletes. You mentioned your your business there as well do you want to give it a little plug or we'll put the links in the description below of this video so whoever wants to get a bit deeper with you they can but yeah Right. Yeah. Um, so my business is Ahead for the Game. Um, got a profile on Instagram, Facebook. Um, I've, I've obviously got my own personal Twitter as well um, and LinkedIn. And then like Neil says, we'll be able to share the link to my website in the comments below. Yeah. So please do check it out, whoever is watching this. For now, Mark, let's just dive straight into it. And an overview question to start with. What does sports and cricket psychology actually mean to you? So I think for me, it's, it's really about supporting people to achieve the best that they can be. So allowing people to optimize their potential. Um, the way that I look at that, I see it as a collaborative thing because I believe that we all have different strengths. We all have different weaknesses. Um, and we can also contribute to each other in different ways. So my slogan for a head for the game is actually a collaborative approach to enhance performance. And where I see that happening is that sometimes as athletes, there, there can be a tendency to perhaps have blinkers on and not see things from a wider perspective. So sometimes not really being able to take that step back. And that collaborative approach with a sports psychologist sometimes provides that opportunity to see things from a different perspective and to be able to say, well, actually, this is an area that I need to develop. But in saying that, 
it, it is about optimizing potential and sports psychology ultimately is about performance. And that's a question I need to ask myself is, can I help this person? Can I develop their, their performance? And if the answer is yes, well, fantastic. We can start working together. But if the answer is no, that becomes a situation where we need to seriously ask ourselves, well, what is it that we're doing here? And I think that's really where an important thing and something that's really prevalent at the moment um, comes into play. And often it's around well-being. And, and that's a priority for me as well, because I, my, my philosophy dictates that I put the person before the performer. Because I believe that if somebody is worried about things or isn't in a great mind space, that we're not going to be able to optimize that performance anyway. So yes, performance needs to be at the fore in terms of the work that I do, but that's really quite well accompanied by well-being as well. Um, so, you know, there, there definitely is that link. Um, and ultimately, it's just about understanding yourself how you respond to particular situations, how you can get the best out of yourself in those situations as well. Is the emotion of worry the most common emotion faced by a sportsman or woman? I, I, I think it would be difficult to say the most common, um, but at the same time, we can both agree here that we both experience worry everybody experiences worry and that's something that's natural um, and the idea with sports psychology is is sometimes actually not to be scared of worry not to try and suppress worry but think about it and say well what am i worrying about here how can i manage this worry and what is it that i want to get out of this particular situation because we may be worrying about something that actually isn't important at all. We may be worrying about something where there's no evidence that should indicate that we should have that extent of worry. Um, so I guess in one breath, you could say, yes, worry is really prevalent, but at the same time, it's something we all experience and, and it's completely natural. So I think thinking about it through a negative lens is something that a lot of sports psychologists would probably challenge you on um, because it's something that we, it's, it's part of our instinct because if we don't worry, we're not going to be able to adapt. We're not going to be able to change. So actually it is a, a really important emotion for us to, um, to, to be able to embrace and understand. You just then draw this back to cricket and give some specific examples. Say if you're talking to a player and a batter, for example, who's worried about getting out, a fielder dropping a catch, a bowler worried that on the weekend they're not going to hit their length, what kind of conversations would you be having with them, for example? Yeah, so I, I think linking this back to cricket, you know, probably in cricket, that's a sport where people worry a, a fair bit. Um, and I think part of the reason is, is the nature of the sport, the demands that are placed on individuals to execute a fairly fine motor skill in a specific moment. You know, a, a bowler has six balls to, to try and get a batsman out at any one time. A fielder probably has one opportunity in a game to, to really impact the game a batsman is is every ball is potentially a risk and and so if we think about it in those sorts of ways we can understand why people worry um but what we would then try and do is contextualize that worry so put it into the big picture and say well you know perhaps we can shift how you think about this because if you're starting to think about um, external things that could influence you or doubt your ability, you're probably in more of a threat state, which is where your worry is going to be heightened. What we want to probably try and do is put you into a challenge state. So really 
nurture a mindset where you're thinking about the things that could happen and thinking to yourself, well, I'm up for that. I've, I've been working on, on hitting my length for the last two weeks. I've been practicing the short ball and that's something that I'm actually quite comfortable with now. I've, I've been, one of, my, one of my focuses at training has been walking in, staying on my toes, being quite reactive to, to what the batsman does. And I know that if a ball comes within three meters either side of me, I can get to that as a fielder. And so I think in terms of that worry in cricket, it's really trying to understand what it's about and then put it into that bigger picture and then try and develop it so that it becomes something that can potentially be productive for that individual. How deep, and just from your experiences and your studies, etc., and involvement in the field, do you look at the difference between the conscious and the unconscious mind? So my, my approach dictates that that's not really something I give too much attention to however you can't ignore that you know there's a whole strand of psychology that focuses on the the conscious and the unconscious and um, why things happen the way that they do um, so we can't ignore that but in terms of my work it's it's really just about understanding someone's experience and so what I would say is I would be talking to a client and trying to understand what their world is like. Um, so, you know, I, I haven't been at, at one end of a cricket pitch facing 90 mile an hour balls. And so I really want to be able to understand what that's like. And if I get an understanding of that, for me, it's not about attributing that to perhaps something that's happened in their childhood or things that are happening unconsciously or consciously. It's just being in that moment and understanding what's going on. Um, and then from there, working with that individual to say, well, what are some of the things that could work here? Because again, I haven't been at one end of a cricket pitch facing those balls. So for me to dictate entirely, this is what you should do isn't necessarily always going to work. So that's where that collaboration comes in. With the current situation in cricket, with all these bio bubbles, mental toughness has been banded around a lot, especially at the highest level. Is mental toughness an inherent trait? So, uh, so mental toughness, resilience, those are two words, like you say, that in the last couple of years have be become really, really prevalent, particularly with COVID. Those, those two words are, are really important. And you've seen players drop, in, drop into tours, drop out of tours because of, of facing some of those challenges that, that COVID has presented us with. Now, is it inherent? I, I think it's something that's learnable. Um, I believe that if you have the right recipe in terms of challenge, in terms of support, in terms of environment, you can develop it. However, we can also argue that our personality and certain personality traits may predispose us to being more resilient or being more mentally tough. Um, so it really is a fine blend, um, but you know, if you have certain, certain characteristics, you may be able to show greater levels of resilience. But actually, if we, if we take the bio bubbles, for example, if you were to leave any players, any group of players alone in their rooms for six to 10 hours of the day, they got out for, say, two to three hours of training, and that was it. That would be really challenging. But if we talk about something like a bio bubble, what that's saying is that, as a group of players, we can all be together. So then actually, what, what I would be thinking from a, a systemic or an organizational perspective is within this bio bubble, what things can we be doing? 
to support these players. Okay, because the challenge is pretty high at the moment. It's something that nobody's ever experienced. They're not allowed to see people in, in the outside world, as it were. So what can we be doing within this bubble to make it more normal, almost? What can we do within this bubble to take their minds away from the fact that they're not going to be able to see family for four weeks while they're on tour? Um, and so really creating that facilitative environment where you're facilitating greater well-being, you're facilitating greater performance is something that I would really be trying to drive home with, with the people that were responsible for those decisions. How do you put confidence in a cricketer? And we can talk about the highest level or even your amateur player playing on a Saturday. Is it wrong for a cricketer to link confidence to weekly performances? Because given the nature of our game, it can fluctuate up and down. Yeah, yeah. And I, th I think confidence is an interesting one because, you know, when, when somebody is not feeling confident about something, so let's just say a cover drive, they're, they're flashing out to cover drives, they're not hitting the gap, and, and you said to them, okay, no bowler, don't worry about a field, I'm going to lob a ball at you, and I just want you to hit that. All of a sudden, what you most likely would find is that they're able to hit it really flush and they'll hit it through the gap. But when you start to place other demands on them, that is perhaps where the confidence becomes challenged because all of a sudden it's a demands versus resources debate and somebody's feeling like they don't have the skill or the ability to meet those demands. And so when we think about building up confidence, we can look at it from two perspectives, I think, where you can actually try and develop the skill. So it may be that actually that individual's cover drive isn't where it should be. So let's spend time with the batting coach. Let's work on your cover drive. Let's give you more confidence in the skill. Or an alternative um, idea is gradual exposure now what i what i mean by that is okay you've got the skill but there's this discrepancy between demands and resources so let's gradually place demands on you until a point where it becomes as good as a game may be so we'll start by lobbing a ball no field set then we'll bring a, a maybe a slower ball bowler in he puts it where you can play those cover drives. Then we start to imagine a field with the bowler. Then we place a field and you, you build it up so that that person can almost have a sense of scaffolding around their skills, something that's holding them up. So they've got confidence in those various little points. And ultimately that's where confidence is so complex because it is multidimensional. And we need to understand that the environment, the people around us, ourselves, um, the, the skill itself are all things that can influence our level or our perceived level of confidence because it is just a construct. Are there any high level exercises that you would advocate? Visualization, breathing exercises that can assist a player with confidence. Say, for example, someone that doesn't have the resources of having a batting coach they can rely on a team environment, a team manager, we're talking about an amateur player here. Yeah. Any exercise they can do that you would, uh, that you would perhaps um, encourage, advocate? Yeah, I, I think, you know, if we think about the core psychological skills, we've got goal setting, imagery, self-talk, um, and relaxation techniques. Those are all, all four skills that you can apply to that. So goal setting, you know, maybe giving yourself process targets that you can work towards that can help develop that sense of confidence. So it could be making sure that you get bat face to the ball, getting your head over the ball, keeping your balance. Those, those could be small little things that you focus on. Self-talk could be positive affirmations 
that you give to yourself before you face up. Um, the other one, um, relaxation techniques. So being able to perhaps control your breathing, feel grounded. And then imagery. At the most basic level, we can picture something in our head. But then actually where that becomes really powerful is by incorporating different senses. And prior to facing a ball, allowing yourself to almost feel like you're there before you faced it. So I think all four of those skills can be really useful to building up that confidence for individuals. How important is routine for a cricketer? Yeah, and I think, you know, this is something that I've spent a lot of time in the last two to three years working with players on is the idea of routine. Because what routine does, it gives us consistency. What consistency means is our mind doesn't have the capacity to be distracted. Our mind is now focusing on task relevant cues. And by doing that, we're, we're enhancing our attention. We're concentrating more. We're focusing on what's important. We're not focusing on what's not important. And by doing that, we're able to build up these neuro, neuromuscular pathways between our mind and our body to say, we know what's coming up here. So we can respond accordingly. And so routines, I think, in terms of cricket, batsmen, bowlers, fielders, I think are, are all really, really valuable. Where does superstition play into this subject of routine? Yeah. Yeah, a lot of cricketers, for example, a batsman, batswoman, they like to put their left pad on before their right, yeah. shoelace, a specific way. You know, where does that come into the topic? Yeah, um, I think superstition is, is superstition. It's personal preference at the end of the day. If somebody puts on their left, left shoe first and then their right shoe, I'm not going to say don't do that because ultimately by doing that, I'm probably going to increase that level of worry because something has changed for them. It actually falls quite neatly into the idea of routine because it's a conscious process. Where it becomes unconscious, perhaps that's where it becomes problematic because we're now putting on our left shoe then our right shoe without thinking about it. And so actually what can happen in those moments is that our mind becomes distracted. Um, but I think the question you're asking is kind of what's the validity of um, superstitions? And there isn't very much research out there at all to say that superstitions and following those superstitions leads to great performance. Marcus, it's been a fascinating chat. Just to end on, what would be the biggest takeaway you'd want a young cricketer to almost, you know, in terms of the best tip and advice um, that you want them to take away from this chat? I think probably the, the biggest thing that I would want someone to take away from this chat is be patient with, with your career. Be patient with your progress because things happen naturally. But we can't just rely on that. What I would say is while you're being patient, really be present with it and, and try and make the most out of every session that you have, every match that you have. Be able to think about those and think to yourself, what went well? What could I do better? And, and then focus on those things. Okay. And focus on those things in a balanced way. Don't just think about the positive or just the negative. Think about both of those. Marcus, perfect. Thank you very much again. Really appreciate it. And all the best for the weeks ahead. Cheers, Neil. Thank you very much. So Neil Kagram, Cricket Love Stories, Marcus Nell. Thank you.